Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Howard. And it was wonderful to hear Tom's work. And uh, thank you so much. Here's to breaking down partitions for connection. I looked up the word sus to sustain, uh, the verb, in my Webster's Third New International Dictionary, um, the first copyright for which was 1961 and the later copyright for which was 1986. The word sustainability isn't in that dictionary. Um, but to sustain, to give support, to furnish relief, to nourish, to cause to continue, to hold the weight of, to carry or withstand, to prevent one's mind from sinking, to endure, to act the part of, to support by adequate proof. I think, you know, the, the root word of sustain is to hold, to hold up. That's the Latin source of the word sustain. And the heart of sustainability is about connection, as Tom so eloquently expressed and explores in his writing. As Adrian Rich might, would, would say, the drive to connect the dream of a common language. That's what we're looking for, a language that is inclusive, not in partitions, and it includes social and economic issues that result from our understanding that we rely on the non-human world for our survival <coughs> and for our, our mental health and physical health. For the future, we have a responsibility for our children. And in terms of the role of art, uh, the, among the beautiful artists and writers, Terry Tempest Williams wrote, Creativity is another form of open space whose very nature is to disturb, disrupt, and bring us to tenderness. To keep us from being numb to our world. Being numb to the world is another form of suicide. And she writes in her book, When Women Were Birds, what is time, sacred time, but the acceleration of consciousness there are so many ways to change the sentences we have been given. So we face uh, evidence of irreparable harm that we, in the advancement of our civilization and out of our sense of what, um, of, and of, of, of a role of, of possession of the natural world rather than companionship with the natural world. The harm that we've done is irreparable, and yet there is possibility for recovery. We have to, Emily Dickinson wrote, when I hoped, I feared, because I hoped, I dared. We have to dare. We have to dare for our children, and we have to dare for those who can't speak for themselves, and so cultivating sensitivity, as Tom was, was expressing, to the natural world, to the other than us, of which we're a part, with which we're connected, which Margaret so eloquently writes about in her book on sustainability, about the networks, how life really is, is more than just the thing, it's the relationship among things. That's true, I think. We're finding this out. So I'm going to start with a poem that I wrote in response to a, an assignment. Uh, to, I was asked to write about the idea of muse. And I went back to images of childhood and my early connections with the natural world. And what Tom was saying uh, in, in his reference to Pete Hoffmeister's observation that the, the harm that's done to children when they don't have natural uh, connection to the natural world. That's, that's a thought I had when I considered bringing this poem today, which is that um, if our children don't have connection with the natural world, how, how will they learn their first lessons 
and connection. Robin Kimmerer in Braiding Sweetgrass wrote, caring is not abstract. The circle of ecological compassion we feel is enlarged by direct experience of the living world and shrunken by its lack. So this is called My First Muse Was Earth. Amber stone beneath a river or a creek, remnant of tree and air. This was before I knew histories of snow. My eyes were hungry and unafraid. I saw fire when the water surprised me with its sting and its ache. That flickering beast, alive, alive, eating my feet to the ankles with its freezing teeth. The wind in the pines carried on in my dreams, and I reached for that dark, called it singing. This next poem is about seeds and future generations, and it was inspired by a seed jar created by an artist who lives in New Mexico, R. Diane Martinez. She is of the Tarahamara Indian uh, background, and she creates beautiful blackware using the images of the stars and the, the thunderbirds. And this tradition comes out of, of the necessity that the native people had of saving their seeds and protecting them from the, the winter weathers and from uh, insects and things that would uh, eat, eat the seeds and to protect the seeds from being, becoming wet and germinating. And so this poem uh, is, is also out of Tom's I was thinking of Tom's words when I decided to share it, which, which he read tonight, that this plant-human relationship is fundamentally physical. Within a few seasons, the genetic makeup of these crops is already being molded by soil and weather and human choice. And this poem is about preserving things and saving them for future harvests. Stories of the Blackware Seed Jar. I have been through fire. My form is fixed, smoke dark, patterns of wing, beak, thunder, and eye. The storm of birds chasing each other, energies of life. My small mouth is starred, cool and dry, remembering seeds of potential. Burnished with stone, I recall patience, through winter, through wind, through the rains that fill the arroyos. I absorb, hold what stirs, rattles like prayers, like snakes, awaiting release until they pour my gifts into the field again, what you imagine. Where I began, seed after seed, fire becoming field, blossom and grain, and all of the voices therein. I live out in Dexter, and some of you may have heard of uh, an issue of mining that took place out there. Parvin Butte is in my neighborhood, and Parvin Butte was purchased by a company that named itself after the, the creek that runs nearby that would be damaged by such mining, Lost Creek Rock Products, and um, they proceeded to, to take down the butte to mine it for gravel, and my community fought this for three years and lost because of different ways of, of legal maneuvering. And we didn't have we, we fought as hard as we could, but it would have required a great deal more expertise and money to fight off and prevent this from happening. So this actually this this experience showed me <clears throat> the reality of legal harm in this what happens <clears throat> when legislation isn't challenged and, and renewed and and made more pertinent. 
And it, I'm just glad we protested because I think they were counting on us not saying a word <clears throat> and things happening and suddenly no butte and how we have not long-term memory for these things. We don't remember unless we fight. So we established a precedent, I hope. <laughs> And this, and, and this led me to further involvement in environmental work with Beyond Toxics. I, even after we lost, I, I couldn't sit and not speak or not learn about how legislation can be changed. And so that, that motivated me to push beyond my comfort zone. This is a poem from Parvin Butte. It's called Mining Parvin Butte. I cannot see it stripped of pine and brush, its raw sides spilling rock and dust, ragged cavity pocked and sinking deeper, seams of narrow road digging in, winding around and around. I cannot see this crazy birthday cake, its little puffs of smoke, its loopholes, rules and laws, this $30 million pile of rocks the ditch around it, cannot see who named a tributary ditch, a mountain pile of rocks, to which they could do anything good for nothing. Cannot see what's happening in the courts of law, what the land is good for. All that money, among the gardens paid for taxes, farms and houses so nearby, invisible, the screech owls call these spring nights, turtles slipping into water from their stones, no wiser for the ditch they're in. Breeding grounds for them, for salmon, water filling wells beneath the ground of sudden blossoms, moss and lichen, what feeds the yearling deer curled among the lavender, the bells of Snow Queen, the cache of iris, Four sail signs everywhere. Another spring opening, undone. I cannot see it. What inspired this poem, I, I wanted to say, to share with you, is the language of dismissal that I wanted to resist. And the language of dismissal was exactly what's included in the poem. The term pile of rocks for Parvin Butte by one of the developers the term ditch for Lost Creek, after which they named their company, um, by one of the developers, and what the land is good for by one of their lawyers. That's exactly what I think Barry Lopez must mean in the rediscovery of North America, when he writes, we have a way of life that ostracizes the land. And that's what we have to stop doing. And that's what the stories and the poetry wake us up to. We connect with the land. We, we don't ostracize it in that way. And once we can feel through empathy, we can take action. That is something, too, that, that Terry Tempest Williams said in an interview a few years ago. The other side of loss is empathy and action. Love making one vulnerable and capable. We have to be vulnerable and capable. And one is not possible without the other. So in, in, in choosing work for tonight through the lens of, vulner of um, sustainability, I included, I realized I was looking for po poems that, that explored or responded to in some way the relationship between the human and non-human world. And this moves into social and economic issues, too, and subjects. And it involves resistance to exploitation as well as longing for relationship with the non-human world. And it involves history, our Western history, our industrial habits. So in this poem, this is a response to a painting by Joseph Wright of Darby. 18th century painter who was known, he was the first artist to capture the awe and wonder inspired by the inventions and technology of the Industrial Revolution. And this subject is uh, 
an experiment on a bird in the air pump. That's the title of the painting. And you will see from the, the epigraph that I include, which is from notes uh, at the gallery, the National Gallery where it is exhibited in London, that um, that was a, a form of pneumatic e e experimentation. And the air pump, they would place birds, for one thing, inside to see what would happen if you extracted the, the air. And of course, they would suffocate. And at first that wasn't understood exactly, but still, there is, there is this relationship. So here is uh, human inventiveness become sensationalistic, I think. I'll just read the poem now. And I saw this, this um, painting, I spot it when I was watching a f uh, the film on a flight, the James Bond film Skyfall, it appears in that film. So that's the context. Within the film, an experiment on a bird in the air pump, in reference to the painting by Joseph Wright of Darby, 1768. Here's the epigraph. A traveling scientist is shown demonstrating the formation of a vacuum by withdrawing air from a flask. Air pumps were developed in the 17th century and were relatively familiar by Wright's day. The artist's subject is not scientific invention, but a human drama in a nighttime setting. We all suffer, don't we? Look, it is our duty. While flying somewhere over Greenland, I suddenly see a segment, Lufthansa's film, the latest James Bond for a long night, the stunning elegance of glass and steel catching my eye. The spectacle of stylized firecrackers shimmering in the dark, one man grappling with another before his fall from a high rise in London. Nothing but wind and enemies in that grid, so graceful, no blood, just him disappearing. Oh, the thrill of that dance, how explosions occur, walls fall away, a man drops from the sky while flying somewhere over Greenland. And when the scene shifts, I recognize that painting behind the characters in a gallery as good a place as any for scheming. And I recognize the blur of the bodies, the blur of what I know as the bird and the subject. That bird is dying, in absolute stillness behind all of the conversation. One wing extended, white plumes of its breast, and slowly but surely, some witnesses suffer their high suffering or pure fascination, while others tenderly look away from what might be violent and irregular convulsions, proving respiration is so necessary to the animals that nature hath furnished with lungs. Their faces glowing in 18th century flame, illuminating the bird in its transparent cage. And I remember where I came from just two days ago, standing in that hall beneath that very grave conductor of air. The light in those faces, light shaped by dark, shaped by the candle and the moon, brow, robe, shoulder, cheek. I imagine the child who did look would never forget this feeding of vision on a table laden with a human skull in its own glowing glass. The bird rare, though common birds like sparrows would normally have been used. Meanwhile, the lid of glass above the bird still held shut or almost lifted by the traveling scientist's delicate grip between thumb and forefinger, the bird, its beak, its eyes still open. I'm going to read one poem from my book. All of these others are new, newer. And this poem was inspired by William Carlos Williams' a poem, Between Walls. And my response to Between Walls was about involvement. I'm very interested in the relationship between the artist and the subject and, and what, what the ethical sense is, um, when, when is the line of objectification being crossed? And this is a small example, but I thought I would introduce the next 
series of poems with this. Carlos's, William Carlos Williams' poem is as follows. Between walls, the back wings of the hospital where nothing will grow lie cinders in which shine the broken piece of a green bottle. And I was taken by the image of beauty found in something broken, and yet I wondered about the absence of information or response to any li living thing or person there. So I wrote this. Broken glass. How it glitters on a ground between two walls. For now, light informs how I feel the world. I search for accuracy. I love the light. I am almost afraid to ask who lives here. Among the elegant phrases, there are silences. This is not just in my mind. I witness fatigue I may never have felt. Of this, I have no doubt. Is there anything I can do? I have broken glass, its edges announcing themselves. This, this poem is also about relation of artist and subject and the use of image. And I, Yvonne Bolin, um, in, her, in her essay, Outside History, Outside History, writes, all good poetry depends on an ethical relation between imagination and image. Images are not ornaments, they are truths. No poetic imagination can afford to regard an image as a temporary aesthetic maneuver. I think that speaks to how we are conscious of responding to our world and communicating through art. This poem was in, uh, is, is in response to a, a painting by Degas. Subject matter. This is an epigraph from another poem about Degas' work and about the siege of Paris. You say that you could never eat a snake. Had you been there, mademoiselle, in 71, this zoo would seem the freshest of buffets. We too would have denied it of ourselves, but war is turpentine that strips the gloss. From Madame L describes the siege of Paris by Beth Ann Fennelly. But war is turpentine that strips the gloss. That is a reference to the technique Degas was experimenting with when he painted his painting, Wimp Woman at a Window, which was during the siege of Paris. An unexpected intimacy, this carrying away, what I hardly see while driving mid-afternoon, what must be a hawk with a smaller creature clutched in its talons. Though for me it is the tension of pure flight, of shadows while knowing it is not simply one body curved beneath another's outstretched wings, the silent passage over the green pastures toward a grove of trees, protective, and this wingless creature the size of a small dog or cat, what must it see for the first time, what cold rush of air, how it must forget its pain in the far away, the shock of grip that takes it there, and I think of the stillness of the woman at a window, a model for Degas in a city under siege, his conveyance of her in essence of oil, like watercolor, paint drained of its oil, her dark dress, possible lace at her wrist, her neck, the hands on her lap in repose, I think, except that fist of light the fingers of her right hand closed, lit by whiteness. The whiteness of the sky in that window, the ragged blur of ochre windows beyond the sash, emptiness filled. How light the cloth cap covering her hair must be, transparent. 
how the light appears to shine against the gravity of her seated form. How the story goes, the artist paid her with a hunk of meat, which she devoured raw. How we observe the effect of her restraint, Degas' experiment, his eyesight ever failing, lifting her out of time just before. Terry Tempest Williams um, writes about intimacy with nature and, and writes that, observes that the, our lack of intimacy with nature is connected to our lack of intimacy with each other. And uh, do I have time for two more poems or one more poem? Do your two. Okay. We, we, we can stay a couple minutes. Okay. I actually, you know, I think I will, I will finish with, with a poem that is a, about recovery. I'll read one poem. And this, uh, this is about, um, this is a response to a recovery of, of forest land that had been cut down. It is about Shot Pouch Creek, which I, I felt very grateful to visit and write in response to which is in the coastal range. And um, a man named Franz Dalp, he had a vision of taking land that had been clear cut and re recovering it, bringing it back to health. And this is something I didn't know when I came there, that it had once been clear cut. I uh, was in the cabin and looking out, it was raining and we were surrounded by beautiful woods with all their complexity. And just beyond, you can see where timber has been cut. There is slash and harvested timber just beyond where we were. And the person I was with said, she remarked, it's hard to believe that it looked like that here at one time. And it, and it's, it gives me such faith. That's what she said. And I thought of the word, Refugia, which I first learned through Kathleen Dean Moore's work. And Refugia, it has to do with refuge. And specifically, in the way Kathleen Dean Moore talked about it, it was about St. Helens, the, the damage caused by St. Helens' eruption, and how the scientists didn't expect that recovery would take place. They thought recovery would take place from the edges on the outside in. Much to their amazement, they saw recovery happening much more quickly from within the devastation site because of these places of protection. And I, th I think of refugia as, as being places such as these recovered woods. I think of refugia as being our gatherings. We're creating we don't know what kinds of life we're creating for the future, but, but we're feeding what is possible to be nurtured for health. And so, in, in honor of the spirit of refugia, I wanted to read this poem, and I'll close with it. Beyond the timber sail boundary, what I was seeing, signs along Shot Pouch Creek, road leading to the gate, an unexpected link how this land took place, forest making, origins reclaimed out of and beyond dry slash, a release of old growth children, everything on the ground, the ground alive, a way to start over. Witness what makes us careful, rough skinned newts, cedar brown, articulate toes and spine untouchable among banks of bleeding hearts. The slow extension of a snail's path, its tentacled eyes, catkins and lichen, trails, tufts of usnea, liberia, tassels, big leaf maple, gold green flowers. What has fallen? What is possible? 13,000 trees, dug fir, western red cedar, western hemlock, noble fir, grand fir, you. 
and over creek rush, the greening nurse log, and the blossom from its delicate stem, call and response, ringing notes of winter wrens, beyond the barren ridges, gathering place, making abundance, recovery. Thank you. Thank you.